So welcome everybody today. Uh, a few housekeeping things before I get going. I hope everybody can hear me okay. I got a pretty big voice. I try to make this an interactive class. I try to keep it as light as I can given that it's a pretty heavy topic. I mean, it, I do what I can with that, but the top, it is what it is. And we're talking about people, um, people in a situation which is, uh, which is life threatening. And, uh, but I'll do the best I can to keep it light. The other thing is questions. If you have any questions at any point, just raise your hand and we'll talk about it. Um, there will be a period at the end for questions and answers, but, but if you're fresh in your mind and you're thinking of something, just raise your hand and we'll talk, we'll, uh, we'll talk things out. So before we start, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and my agency. My name is Bob Elliott. I'm a lieutenant with Maine Capitol Police. Um, and I've been, you know, protecting um, state government now for just over 30 years. And uh, so I can attest that state government is a pretty safe place uh, for you to be. The one of the differences between our agency and most police agencies that you come across is our goal. And although our cops are real honest-to-God cops, same as they are for Augusta PD or any other police department, um, our, we're very much a campus police department. Our goal is to keep people safe and to keep the bad guys from coming here in the first place. So if we don't have any crime, we're doing a great job, unlike most departments that, that, um, that look at their success rate on how many crimes they solve, we're trying to keep those from happening here uh, in the first place. So we're very much a preventative um, agency. The other part about what I do is, that, is the changes that have taken place in my 30 years here. When I came here, we were very much an asset protection agency. We were here to protect state stuff, right? And over time, we realized that what we really need to be spending our time on is public safety. Because what is the state's most important asset? It's the people who work here, visit here, and in case of Riverview Psychiatric Center, which we police live here, right? So it's our duty to keep you safe, and that's why we're here primarily. All that other stuff uh, we'll still deal with, locking doors and making sure people park in the right places and trying to keep people from going too fast. But our real goal is to keep people that are here safe. And part of that goal is these presentations that I go around state government. I do a number of different presentations. But this one is the one that's most sought after. And why is that? Because this is the one that's most likely, if it should ever come here, um, you would like to have some tools in your tool pouch and know what you can do, what your options are to respond should something like this occur, right? So that's what brings me here today. So before we start, let's talk a little bit about what this is. This is not a tactical class designed for a law enforcement audience. This is for the average state worker who is in their cubicle and hears gunshots, okay? And what do you do? And that was the design of the class, was for the average worker. Um, but what I want you to do today is a number of things. This applies to you um, wherever you go. So all the principles I'm going to teach you today not only apply to you at work, but apply to you, what are these people looking for? What are the bad guys looking for? They're looking for places where there are a lot of victims, right? So church on Sunday, the mall on a Saturday, right? The high school basketball game, um, the pageant, all those things, the concert, the movie theater, are places where these events are happening nationwide. Okay, so take what you learned today with you and all the principles you're going to hear today apply wherever you are in whatever walk of life you're in. What I'm not here to do today is I'm not here to be a fear monger. Okay, I'm not here to try to convince you that next week or next month someone's going to come into your work site and start shooting or into, your, into the mall where you're shopping on a Saturday because it's a very low probability. We live in a really safe state here in Maine. Right? And state government, and I can attest to this personally because I've been here for 30 years, is a really safe place to work. It really is. But that doesn't mean that just like we prepare for tsunamis and for um, deadly earthquakes and deadly tornadoes, which are a very low probability of happening here, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't prepare for that, right? The same as we do for those other natural disasters that we prepare for. So I'm happy to be here today. I'm happy that your managers have decided that this is important enough information for you to get to take two hours away from your work that you're doing for the people of Maine to sit in this class and maybe walk away with some ideas should this occur here or should this occur at the mall or those other places. So before we start, this class is really a three-part class. The first part is what is an active shooter? Before, because before we can stop, talk about how to respond to that, we have to know what it is, right? Then the second part, and we'll talk about that both anecdotally and statistically. And with some of the statistics, you may, you may find that they dispel some of the myths you have about these events. Okay? 
One of those myths is that these, are, these always occur with an assault rifle, right? Those statistics show us that that's just not true. You know, what is the weapon of choice, do you think, most often in these events in, nationwide? 22. What's that? 22. A handgun, right? Why would it be a handgun? Because it's easy to conceal. You can hide it, right? So although, you know, the, if you listen to the media, you're under the impression that it's always an assault rifle, the statistics don't prove that out. The statistics show that most often it's a handgun, okay? So there are other things that we probably, that you might think in, in your mind to be the truths about these events that we'll show you statistically might not be that way. The second part of the class is what you came here for today. What do you do? You know, what, what are your options should this occur? Should it be someone with a knife or a gun or a car or whatever it is? What are your options for response, okay? And then the third part of the class, we'll have a break, and then the third part of the class is how do we prepare? How do we prepare as agencies and as individuals um, and as managers and as supervisors should this come to us, okay? So an active shooter is an individual who's engaged in killing or attempting to kill people. In most cases, active shooters use firearms and there's no pattern or method to their selection of victims. Well, that's a cop definition. That's from the United States Tactical Police Officers Association, okay? But what that basically means is unlike the normal homicide, which may be a mass murder, in these cases, the bad guy is randomly and continually killing until he is usually stopped, okay, either by suicide or by police intervention or by some other use of force, okay? Statistically, though, we'll show that over the last couple of years that's kind of changed and more and more people are trying to get away. But for the most part, um, they're continuing to kill until stopped. So even though we had a mass shooting up in, up in Madison a few years ago where a guy killed members of his family, that wasn't an active shooter because he wasn't randomly and continually killing um, people. He was targeting certain people, and once they were, they were dead, he stopped. Okay? So the other part of this is we shouldn't get pigeonholed into believing that active shooter is always a gun, because even by its term, shooter, it implies it's a gun. But you can have an active shooter event that meets that definition with someone using a truck. We've seen it, randomly and continually killing, right, in France, in, in New York City, okay? or a knife or a hatchet, or any number of weapons. So let's not get, get all um, concerned about what the weapon is so much as what, what the type of activity that's occurring is occurring. One of the things that you're gonna learn is that these things happen very quickly, and that's why you're here today. Um, this is not a, a call that the TAC team or the SWAT team is gonna go to, because by the time they get ready and they get there, it's over with. This isn't even a call that in most cases the police may not get there in time to stop it, okay? Because these things happen really fast, and you have to make some decisions about how to protect your own life, okay? Um, and we'll see that as we move forward as to reasons why you're going to do what you do, because you don't have time to do a lot of the a lot of the thinking that's involved, okay? So let's look at some examples of active shooter. And I go back to 1966. This is a bell tower on the campus of the University of Texas in Austin. And although there were some other events prior to this, this is the first one nationwide that kind of, kind of uh, got everybody thinking about these kinds of events. This guy was an ex-Marine who climbs to the top of this bell tower and he's carrying three duffel bags full of rifles, okay? So you say to yourself, well, how could he do that? How could he possibly get into a building on a campus of a university with duffel bags full of rifles? Well, this is 1966. There was no reception desk with glass and a sign-in sheet. I'm sure all, almost every door to that building was unlocked during the day. Right? Much like it was when I came to state government. Everybody, everybody's been around for a while remembers that. So he climbs to the top of the bell tower and he starts shooting people in the college campus below, some of them out to 500 yards away with these rifles. Well, the police response that day, because they'd never seen anything like this, was a very ad hoc, very seat-of-the-pants response. They armed a civilian, because um, it was Texas, right? <laughs> okay. and they climbed to the top of the bell tower and they took this guy out. Okay? Because, I mean, I actually seen video of this where, there, where some hunters were in Austin and they're down on the street with rifles with, with, uh, with scopes on them shooting at the guy up in the bell tower, just civilians, okay? So you say from that, well, you know, and there was a movie made about this. Anybody may have seen the old black and white movie that was made about this event. Well, that would be the police response, right, from now on. Well, it really wasn't. Although we, that's what the first SWAT team was formed from this because um, people, LAPD looked at this event and said, we need to form a SWAT team to deal with this kind of situation. But there really wasn't that kind of a response. Everybody remembers Columbine, right? This is 1999. Everybody remember this one? And why do we all remember Columbine? 
It's kids, right? And not only is it kids that are being killed, but it's kids that are the bad guys. You know, it's children shooting children. And that, as a society, that just struck us. It just paralyzed us. Does anybody remember the problem with the police response to Columbine? Well, the cops did what I was trained to do 30 years ago when I went to the academy, which was you set up a perimeter and you wait for SWAT. You wait for those special weapons and tactics folks to come and solve your problem, right? So what do you think these two high school kids were doing during the time that they were out there setting up their perimeter and waiting for SWAT? It was 22 minutes before the first cop went into that school, okay? Well, I can tell you what they were doing, whatever they wanted. Okay, I've seen the security footage of this, and they were on top of chairs taunting kids and shooting at them under tables. They had reign of the school to do whatever they wanted and cause as much terror as they felt like causing. But we learned from this and said, hey, we can't be doing that from now on. We've got to get right in and try to stop the shooting. So now we all train the same way with rapid response. Every law enforcement officer nationwide trains that way now. Okay? So, we, so we did learn from this one. Virginia, this is Virginia Tech. And at the time, in 2007, uh, in terms of casualties, that was our biggest event in the United States. And that's changed, um, obviously, uh, and, and horrifically, those numbers have gone up. Um, but does anybody remember the problem at Virginia Tech? And the university is still in litigation over it today. Hmm? Yeah, they failed to notify other students on the campus that they had a shooter. And I've got to tell you, we're there in state government, right? We don't have a way to quickly let people know when we've, got a, when we've got a situation. And I've been standing on my soapbox now for five or six years giving these classes and, uh, and urging us to get something like that, okay? But it's not there yet, and we're gonna talk about that as we get to the planning part. Um, U.S. Army Major um, Dadal Hassan, this was down in Texas at Fort Hood. Um, he was a psychiatrist there. And this, from my understanding, this was the first case where um, Active shooter was used as a form of terrorism here in the United States, domestic terrorism. And this guy goes into the dining hall at Fort Hood, kills 13 and wounds another 29 before he's taken into custody. 2011, this one I put in because, and hopefully the reason these are here is because each one of them makes a point about response or about something else about these events, how they're changing over time. Usually, like I said in the definition, these things happen in a confined area. Well, this was in a parking lot at a Safeway, so it was very much out in the open. This was U.S. Representative Gabrielle Gifford, who was doing a town hall meeting there in the parking lot. And a young guy with uh, untreated mental illness comes in and uh, ends up killing a six and wounding another 13 before he is stopped and arrested. Colorado. This was... Uh, a guy that goes to a midnight showing of the Batman premiere, The Dark Knight Rises. Anybody remember this one? You know, why would he choose that? Why would he choose that place to do this? Confined, Confined yes, but what else? What's a guarantee at that premiere is going to be happening? It's full, right? He's going to get maximum, maximum potential for victims. And it's dark, and it's confined. So you add all those things up, it, uh, from, from a bad guy's standpoint, it makes a pretty good sense to do it there. So one of the things that I wanted to tell you about this event in Colorado, and this, by the way, is the event that brought me here today. I was on vacation with my family down in Ohio when this happened. And a couple of days after um, this event, we went to a movie uh, in Columbus. And, uh, and we got to the movie theater, and there was a local Columbus cop with a rifle standing at the door of the movie theater. I remember thinking, oh, my God. You know, what have we come to as a society where we have to put, you know, police officers at the doors of our movie theaters? And I was driving home with my wife, and I remember I told her, I said, you know, we don't do anything to prepare state employees should this come to us in state government, you know. And I advocated to start doing this class. And I went to my, my chief and my commissioner and made my case that we should start offering these classes to state agencies. And here I am today, five years later, still giving these classes. But in this case here, the guy goes in to the showing. He buys a ticket and goes in and sits and watches about 20 minutes of the movie. Then he gets up goes out one of those emergency exits down in the front of the theater, and uh, he chalks the door open behind him. Out behind the theater, he's got his car parked with uh, all kinds of tactical stuff. He's got a, a bulletproof vest and a flak helmet, groin protector, and all this stuff. Puts all this stuff on, gets a rifle, a shotgun, and a handgun, goes back into the theater and starts shooting people. Well, the first cop, from the time the first call went into 911 until the first cop was there was 45 seconds. 
pretty good response time. You, that was because the cops were out front of the theater directing traffic for the premiere. Okay? First cops there in 45 seconds. Now this guy is a doctoral student who's spiraling downward mentally, okay? And he's not a gun guy, all right? So all three of his weapon systems fail. His, he either runs out of bullets or they, or they jam. He doesn't know how to fix the jam. So he goes back out to his car, we think, to get more, more bullets or more guns or to fix the problem. And there's a cop out back who takes him into custody, okay? So from the time that first call to 911 went into, in, went, got in, until he was in handcuffs, seven minutes had elapsed total. And in that seven minutes, he managed to kill 14, wound another 50. So almost 80 people killed or wounded. So what does that tell us? We don't have time when these things happen. We need to make some decisions about how to protect ourselves, right? Good. So the next one, Sandy Hook. This is 2012, and we all remember Sandy Hook, right? Because not only is this kids, this is really young kids, okay? This is at a pretty affluent community, about four and a half, five hours south of us down there in uh, Newton, Newton uh, Connecticut. Um, guy goes in and shoots out the door to the school. Uh, young guy, again, the causation factor in that one was untreated mental illness. He goes in and he starts to shoot kids. I got to tell you, after that event happened, they tore that school down and they've just reopened it, a new Sandy Hook school, and it is the most fortified school in the United States. It's amazing the stuff they put in to keep their kids safe. Washington, D.C., I have this one in there. Everybody remember the Navy Yard shooting? Guy goes in. Um, the things that are interesting about this one is the first is this guy's an employee there. He's a contract worker who has an access card and uh, can get anywhere he wants in the building. Second thing is, it's a really heavily policed facility. They've got their own police force. You've got to go through a gate to get in. Um, they had the U.S. Naval Police there. And even though it had their own police force, he still managed to kill 12 and wound another 8 before he was stopped. Okay? So here again, making that point that you don't have time to wait for somebody to tell you what to do. The other part of this event was it was a shotgun. It was not an assault rifle. This guy had a shotgun. And then the fourth interesting thing about this is this was one of the first cases in the United States where he fought the police. Okay? Up until then, when the bad guy heard the police coming, usually they committed suicide or they were taken out by the responding law enforcement. In this case here, he, he, uh, he fought back. And why was that? To buy time, right? get more victims. So we're seeing these slight changes over time. 2015, well now these things are happening so often, right? The FBI tells us they're happening with three times the frequency they were prior to 2014. In this one here, um, the reason these are up there is because the causation factor in the bulk of these was ideology, okay? So someone was mad about abortion, so he shoots up an abortion cl clinic. We had the church down south where the guy was a racist and goes in and kills black people. Right? We had um, the uh, Army Reserve Center in Chattanooga where a guy goes in and starts shooting Marines and Naval personnel. So these are people who have ideological reasons, terrorism reasons, ban San Bernardino with terrorists um, that are using those causation factors to do these kinds of events. And we're seeing more and more of that as we move forward. Because terrorists aren't stupid. They, see, they look at what works. You know, what works to put fear in our society? These events work, right? And they cause fear. Washington, oh, I went backwards. Orlando. So now here we are, 2016, um, Pulse nightclub down there in Orlando. And this guy um, goes in there, he pledges his allegiance to ISIS, um, goes in there and kills 49 patrons and wounds another 50, 53 at a nightclub in, uh, in Orlando. And I got to tell you, as we get to the planning part of this, I'm going to tell you that not all those people had to die. They didn't. If they had done the things that I'm going to teach you to do today, some of those folks would have walked out of that nightclub. And we'll, we'll get to that part, and we'll talk about that as we move forward. Ohio State. This one is there because this guy um, was uh, inspired by ISIS or ISIL. Um, he goes in with a butcher knife, and he attacks uh, people on the campus of the University of, of uh, Ohio, Ohio State. And then he, he drives through people with a car, jumps out with a knife, and uh, starts, to, starts to hack people. Uh, he ends up wounding 13 before he's killed by a university police officer. The reason I have this in there is because here again, this was not a gun. This was a knife. So it doesn't have, don't get caught up on the fact it always has to be a gun. 2017, this was um, 
the baseball game down there in, in Virginia where the Republicans were uh, practicing for a charity baseball game, members of Congress. Guy goes up and asks someone watching the game, the practice, if they're Republicans or Democrats. They tell him it's Republican, then he opens fire on the field, and the U.S. Capitol Police end up shooting him. Las Vegas, right? And everybody remembers this one. Just uh, last year, 59 people dead, 546 injured. You know, not all from gunshots. A lot of those were from stampeding and that kind of thing of people trying to get away, right? But we all remember the images from the, uh, from the window of the hotel, those, those gunshots, that muzzle flash going. How do you defend against something like that? Pretty hard, but now we have to start thinking about that, protecting our rooftop, making sure that you know, we've got overcover and those kinds of things when we have events. It's unfortunate that we're at that point, but we are there. New York City, I put this one in here, here again, just to make the point that it is sometimes a vehicle, and this guy rams a crowd there in uh, near, I don't know if it's in or near um, Times Square, and, uh, runs over eight people, killing them. Texas, this one was at the church down in Texas, 26 people dead. And then we come to Parkland this year, right? So this is another one of those misnomers. We all believe it's in our schools. That's where it's happening the most, and it is happening in our schools but it's happening just as often in our work sites, and the statistics will show that. But when it happens in a school, what happens? It goes on front page news, and it should. And it stays there for weeks instead of just a blip, right? But Parkland, how do we harden our schools? How do we prepare for these things? So you say, well, this is Florida. This is California. You know, this isn't Maine. And although, like I told you earlier, Maine's a very safe place, we're not immune to this kind of activity. And I go back to 1993. Uh, this, was a, uh, this was right here in state government, down at the Department of Professional Financial Regulation, which is up on Northern Avenue in Gardner. And this guy, um, and you'll notice I don't use any names. Uh, I used to have the names of all the bad guys and all these slides. And I took them out because I thought, you know, why am I, why am I making them famous? Why am I going to help them in their quest to be known? These are just nothing but cowards, so I took them all out. Um, so this guy goes into the, uh, calls his wife who works there and they're having some domestic issues, and he tells her that he's coming there to kill her, and she believes him, and uh, when he arrives, she's, and she's been drinking, and when he arrives, she, she's in a Gardner police cruiser um, telling him that she's afraid he's going to come there, and he goes in, and back then, you know, there was no reception desk with glass to sign in. He just walks in, and he walks back until he finds her desk, and he sits down, and uh, so Gardner police go in. They quietly evacuate the building, as they make their way back to him, he sees the police, the gun comes out, and they stand at gunpoint with each other talking, and eventually after two hours he gives up, and, and negotiation worked in that, in that instance. But that's right here in state government. So although we're not, it's not probable it's going to occur here, we have to always be aware of the fact it could. And that's why, that's why your managers took two hours out of your time to bring you here today. Waterville, and to me this, to, this is the only case that I know of that meets that definition of an active shooter. This is a nunnery there on Silver Street in Waterville. A mentally ill man who was off his medication goes into the nunnery and starts to bludgeon and stab nuns and continually and randomly picking his victims until he's taken into a custody by Waterville PD. Stockton Spring School. Anybody here remember this one? It's amazing how few people remember this event in Maine. Um, they actually, Channel 6, uh, WCSH, just did a just did a, sh a story on this about three weeks ago where they talked to some of the victims who are now grown. But this guy goes into the Stockton Springs School with a gun and holds a, holds a fifth grade hostage. And um, he ended up uh, letting, uh, the first negotiation with him started from a school bus driver and then teachers, and then the police arrive and they started to negotiate with him. And he ends up letting, um, letting a disabled student leave and then he lets the teacher leave the room. And then eventually, after I think a couple of hours, he lets the rest of the fifth graders go. So a real close as we've come here in Maine to a, to a tragedy in our school, right there at that little school on the coast of Maine. Portland High School. This was not actually at Portland High School. This was 2010. But this was behind the school. A Portland cop, who was a school resource officer, was checking the back door of the school to make sure it was locked or unlocked or whatever he does there. And he looks across the parking lot, and he sees a man standing by the rear of a car and he's loading a rifle. But he figures out this guy probably isn't going hunting. This guy is going into the, school, into the church behind the school to kill people at an AA meeting. So the cop you know, was at the right place at the right time, just dumb luck, and uh, averted a tragedy there. 
2012, Verso Mill in J. Anybody remember this one? This was a case of uh, workplace violence. This guy had been fired. He had sprayed a, ho a water hose into the face of a coworker. He'd been fired for that because uh, it was an act of violence. And he wasn't very happy about it. He goes back to the mill with a shotgun and a handgun, and he holds the mill manager hostage for eight hours while the state police negotiate with him, eventually giving up and being taken into custody. The main turnpike, this was about a week after that shooting at the movie theater in Colorado. And this guy is going down the turnpike at 112 miles an hour. And a trooper pulls him over and says to him, where are you going in such a hurry? And the trooper says, I'm going to New Hampshire, uh, the, the bad guy says, I'm going to New Hampshire to kill my boss. And that's exactly where he was going. Um, he searches the car, finds a handgun between the seats and a rifle in the trunk. And it turns out this is a guy who's mentally ill, who's been untreated for that. And uh, it was about a week after the showing at the movie theater, at the event at the movie theater, and he actually admitted that he went to a showing of that movie here in Maine with a handgun, but decided not to do anything that night here in Maine. So we've been lucky, you know. We've had those close calls, but we've been pretty lucky about it. So now we know what, they, what it is anecdotally. Let's talk about some statistics. And this was a risk mitigation report that came out from NYPD in 2012. And they looked at 271 cases of active shooter in the United States until that date. Well, that right there struck me. Oh my God, 271 events in this country that met that definition at that time is, I just thought that was way more than I thought we would get. But what they found was most of the time it's a male, most of the time it's a male acting alone. Although like San Bernardino showed us, it could be females, right? We just had a woman who walked into the YouTube headquarters in California with a gun and shot some people. So, Although it's not usual, usually it's a man. Um, mo and their planning and tactics can range from really extensive to hardly any, where a guy just gets mad, gets a gun, and goes in, right? But in, in Columbine, those kids planned that event to such an extent that they were wearing trench coats to school for weeks before they did it, you know? And, they, and the other students started calling them the trench coat mafia. Anybody remember that? Well, why were they wearing trench coats to school? Because on the day they were going to do this, that's where they were going to hide their long guns and their bombs and things. And they knew that they wanted to cause normalcy and that make people used to them doing that. So where are these things happening? Like we talked about, you know, if you listen to the mass media, it's always in our schools. We need to harden our schools. We need to put more you know, cops in our schools. And 24% of the time, it is in our schools. But an equal percentage of the time, these things are happening in our open commercial spaces. Retail, restaurants, places like that. 11% of the time it's in office buildings, 12% of the time it's factory and warehouse. So add those two together, what do you have? 23% of the time workplace, right, which is why you're here. 29% of the time other, churches, hospitals, government meetings. Anybody here ever go to a government meeting where someone might be disgruntled? It keeps us in business, right? <laughs> and how are these things resolved when they happen? And remember, these statistics are from 2012, and at that time, 83% of the time it was through applied force or suicide, 16% of the time it was, it was negotiation. So we've been pretty lucky here in Maine. We've been able to negotiate our way out of some of this stuff. Less than 1% of the time did it end up with someone fleeing the scene. And we're seeing that change more and more, especially as these things are used for um, terrorism. So this is 2014, and the FBI shows us that the frequency of these events is happening three times as often as it was prior to 2014. So this year, the U.S. Secret Service came up with some new statistics. They looked at the 28 events of active shooting in the United States last year. What they find was 13 of those were in businesses, nine of those were in open spaces. So more and more are happening in open spaces like the concert venues outside. Four were in schools, three were in transportation, and two were in churches. So just like I just said, the mass media it's always in our schools. Well, 13 of those were businesses last year. 17 of the attacks occurred before 3 p.m. Why is that? Well, if you're going to do it and you're planning it, why would you wait? Tomorrow's the day. Let's go get it done, right? 50% of the events were over within five minutes. Half of them were done with in five minutes. So if you're waiting for the cops to come save you, probably not going to happen. It might, but you've got to have a plan. 46% of the people that did this had grievances, 21% of them, them were workplace, 18% of them were domestic, and 7% were personal. 21% had ideological issues or, ra or, or racially based um, motives. 
4% were because of mental health. 4% were because of politics. And this was a new one. 4% were seeking fame which is a new, kind of a new change. Is these people are doing this to become famous. So, everybody knows what an actual shooter is, right? Any questions so far about what we're talking about? None. So now here's what you came here for today, right? What do you do? What do you, how do you respond should this come to you, okay? And I am asking, what do you do? Run, hide, or fight. What else? Duck, right? What else? This is gunshots, so be giving me some ideas because people are dying. What else are you going to do? Assess the situation. Right, assess what's going on. Anything else? Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Call, call, call for help. Yeah, all good stuff. Okay? But that just gives an example of, you know, while some people are standing there with a blank stare, what's happening? Time is going by. Critical time for you to make some decisions about your responses, right? So you need to quickly uh, determine the most reasonable way to protect your own life. Customers and clients are likely to follow your lead because you work there, they're going to assume you know what to do. Okay? So state employees hate this part. They hate it because they can't rely on a supervisor to tell them what to do. They can't blame somebody because they weren't told. They have to make some decisions for themselves about how to protect their own lives. Okay? And we hate that when they tell us that. Right? I'm, you know, I'm a state employee. I'm in that same group. I hate that. I want someone to tell me. I want someone to advise me. Right? But you have to make some determinations. And take those personal safety initiatives. Remember, active shooter events happen really fast. This says 10 to 15 minutes. I, I assert it's less than that. And use your senses. What are your senses telling you? So what are you looking for? You're looking for time and distance. Do I have enough time and distance from that bad guy to leave? Okay? Or is he coming through the door right now? Then I have to make a different decision, right? I don't have that option to leave. So base your decisions on what your senses are telling you, okay? What do I have for time and distance from the bad guy? This is a video that was produced by the city of Houston. It is PG-13 violent. It may feel like just another day at the office. But occasionally, life feels more like an action movie than reality. The authorities are working hard to protect you and to protect our public spaces. But sometimes, bad people do bad things. Their motivations are different. The warning signs may vary, but the devastating effects are the same. And unfortunately, you need to be prepared for the worst. If you were ever to find yourself in the middle of an active shooter event, your survival may depend on whether or not you have a plan. The plan doesn't have to be complicated. There are three things you could do that make a difference. Run, hide, fight. First and foremost, if you can get out, do. Always try and escape or evacuate even when others insist on staying. Encourage others to leave with you, but don't let them slow you down with indecision. Remember what's important, you, not your stuff. Leave your belongings behind and try to find a way to get out safely. Trying to get yourself out of harm's way needs to be your number one priority. Once you are out of the line of fire, try to prevent others from walking into the danger zone and call 911. The 
If you can't get out safely, you need to find a place to hide. Act quickly and quietly. Try to secure your hiding place the best you can. Turn out lights, and if possible, remember to lock doors. Silence your ringer and vibration mode on your cell phone. And if you can't find a safe room or closet, try to conceal yourself behind large objects that may protect you. Do your best to remain quiet and calm. As a last resort, if your life is at risk, whether you are alone or working together as a group, fight. Act with aggression. Improvise weapons. Disarm him. And commit to taking the shooter down, no matter what. Try to be aware of your environment. Always have an exit plan. Know that in an incident like this, victims are generally chosen randomly. The event is unpredictable and may evolve quickly. The first responders on the scene are not there to evacuate or tend to the injured. They are well trained and are there to stop the shooter. Your actions can make a difference for your safety and survival. Be aware and be prepared. And if you find yourself facing an active shooter, there are three key things you need to remember to survive. Run, hide, fight. Okay, run, hide, fight. Everybody remember stop, drop, and roll from when we were kids, right? I guess this is stop, drop, and roll for 2018, unfortunately. This video uh, is available on, on YouTube, and I would encourage you to share it with members of your family. I wouldn't show it to, to young children, but high school kids and above, I certainly think it's worth having everybody watch uh, this video. Um, because, quite honestly, that's the quickest way to protect yourself. Run, hide, and fight. So this is state government. So I have to make it more complex, right? So I put in run out, call out, hide out, keep out, and um, take out, right? Which are, you know, obvious, but you don't always think about all those things, right? So let's look at each one of these. What's the first thing you should try to do if you can? If your senses are telling you you have time and distance from the bad guy, okay? He's way down at the end of that hall, right? You're hearing shots way off in the distance. We have time to leave. And that's what we should always do as a first thing, if we can, is try to get out. Okay? That's why it's in that sequence. Run, then hide, then if you can't do anything else, fight, right, as your last resort. Right? So how do you do that? The biggest thing you've got to remember is, and, and your plan for active shooters is not going to be the same as it is for a fire or a natural disaster, right? Because that exit that you always use for the fire drill, and we all know from our work site where we're going to go, right? We're going to get up, we're going to go out this way, we're going to take a right, we're going to go down this hall. It's actually posted right there by the door. What if that bad guy is between you and that exit? Oh, nobody ever told me about that, right? And maybe for an active shooter, you don't want to be waiting out in the parking lot where you always wait during a fire drill. Because what if the bad guy is an employee and they know where everybody's going, right? So maybe for an active shooter plan, it says something like, you know, we're going to meet and we're going to go lock in over at the state police garage. Or we're going to go to 51 Commerce and lock in. Or we're going to scatter to the wind. Right? So a different plan than you would have for a fire drill. Okay? So you, but you're gonna, re, you're gonna try to leave regardless of whether others are willing to follow. Right? So why aren't you gonna try to get your coworkers to go with you? What's that? Time. Time. 
You don't have time to negotiate. Come on, we ought to go. No, I think we ought to hide. No, what's happening? Time's going by. Grab them by the shirt and pull them, and if they don't want to go, leave them. Okay, you don't have time for that. Get out, okay? Um, try it. Now, when you leave, right, you're going to leave your stuff behind. It's not like that fire drill. We've all been there, right? Ah, I think I'm going to take an umbrella because it might rain. Take my coat because it might be cold out there. Who knows how long we'll be standing around. Take some extra work. State employees, I know better. <laughs> but why don't you take your stuff with you, okay? Your stuff's not important. You are. You're trying to save your life, okay? What's the other thing you've got to remember? Who's responding to these events? Who's running in while you're running out? I am. What do I want to see? Do I want to see someone coming at me with a bunch of stuff in their hands that I have to determine, is that a rifle or is that an umbrella? Okay, what do I want to see? I want to see this. Okay, I want to immediately know that at this moment, this person running toward me is not a threat. It doesn't mean necessarily you're not the bad guy. Because in Parkland, we saw that, right? The bad guy was wearing a high school t-shirt and got in line with the kids and left the school. But what it means is right now, he's not a threat. I'm going to let him or her go. Okay? So that's what we want to see, people with their hands raised and their fingers spread apart. The other thing is when you leave, um, you're not going to help the wounded. Why? What's that? Time. time. You don't have time. Okay? Even the responding police are not going to help the wounded until we stop that shooter. Because every time that gun goes off, someone's dying. Right? We'll come back. We'll help them. We'll get rescue teams in there just as fast as we can once the place is made safe. Okay? So you've got you to leave. Those. And it's hard to do. I saw an interview with one of the cops that responded to the Navy Yard. He said one of the hardest things he had to do in his career was run past those people laying on the floor who were pleading for his help. But he knew there were still gunshots going off, and he had to stop that. Okay? So you can't, once you're out and you're in a safe location, or you're hiding in a safe location, what do you got to do? You got to call some help, right? Get someone coming to help you. Call 911, right? So when you do that, what kind of information is the dispatcher going to want to know? Location. Where are you, right? And when we talk about where are you, what are we talking about? Address. Your physical address, right? Because if you say CMCC, they may not know where that is, okay? Give that physical address of your location. In Columbine, cops came from 80 miles away. And if you tell my cops, I'm at the Tyson Building, Department of Corrections, we all know where you are. But Augusta cops don't know where that is. County sheriffs don't know where that is. The trooper from Aroostook doesn't know where that is. Okay? So give that physical address. What else? Number of shooters. Number of shooters? Sure. What else? Does the dispatcher want to know? Oh, come on, people. What do they want to know? Any wounded or? How many wounded? Right? What's going on? How about starting there? We got a guy shooting the place up, right? We got an actor shooter. And if you say that to most dispatchers, they know exactly what you're talking about. Maybe a description of the bad guys, right? So when I arrive, I know am I looking for a male in a trench coat or am I looking for a female? Okay? Am I looking for, you know, what am I looking for? Old man, young man, black, white, what am I gonna get here? Okay? What else? What kind of weapon? What kind of weapon? Yeah, and even if you're not a weapons person, you can tell the dispatcher it's a knife, it's a rifle, or it's a handgun, right? So give whatever you know about the weapon. Anything else for information? I think we got them all. Let's look. Physical, physical address. Where within the location is this guy? Is he down in the Department of Public Safety in the front of the building, or is he in the Department of Labor in the back of the building, right? I think we got everything else. <clears throat> so your sensors are telling you that you do not have time and distance from the bad guy to leave. He's out here in the hallway. Okay? So I can't leave because it's going to put me right in, the, in harm's way. So what's your next thing to try to do? It's a shelter in place. Try to hide. Right? So when you do that, what do you, do you think this is a great hiding location this guy's chosen? No. Probably not. Right? He's probably chosen the place he's going to die. But it may be the best he's got at that moment. But what I would do if it was me, and that's the best I've got, is if my sensors are telling me that I'm gaining time and distance, the bad guy's going away from me, I'm going to be seeking a better place to hide. Okay? But the other flip side of that is, if you're in a really good place to hide, stay there. Why would you leave? Right? These are actual cell phone photos from Virginia Tech. And those kids, one of the things that the bad guy did there was he chained the doors shut from the inside to try to slow the response of law enforcement. 
and it worked somewhat. I mean, they got in, but it did slow them down somewhat. Well, that wouldn't work today because we all carry breaching tools in our cruisers, so it probably wouldn't work for us today. But that's one of the things they do. They learn from these events, and they do more of this stuff. These kids made it out, and what they did was they shut the lights out. They all, this is the actual cell phone picture. They moved to the side, and they pretended like nobody was home, and they made it. So when you find that place to hide, try to find a place that gives you good protection. Okay, Solid doors, um, very few windows, if you can find those kinds of places. And in our work sites now, it's hard to find those spots, right? Because we build our buildings open because they're easier to heat, easier to light. We put cubicles in. Right? Because from an engineering standpoint, that makes sense for that. I like unisex bathrooms <clears throat> because they usually have a solid door. They usually have a lock on the inside. Um, there's sometimes there's a cubicle inside that. There's a, there's a, I forget what you call it, a stall where you can get a little more protection. The only problem with unisex bathrooms is you can't get a lot of people in there. Okay? Um, break rooms. If there's a door on it and it's open during the day and it locks from the inside, break rooms make good safe rooms. Okay? But walk through your facilities when you get back to work and look at what would make, what, when we're going to do that, is identify those rooms that would make good safe rooms and where you can hide. When you go back to your work sites, do your doors open in or do they open out? Do they have locks on them? That's the kind of stuff I want you to look at, okay? We all do it. When that, when that megabucks, a tri-state deal, when that gets really big, what do we do? We all think about it, right? My wife and I, when we're driving to work, oh, man, when we win that tonight, I'm going to have the biggest boat you've ever seen, and we're going to have a place to live in Jamaica, and we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And that day, we all do that daydreaming because it's fun, right? But do we do that with emergency stuff? Do we sit and daydream about what would we do if there's a fire at my house at 2 o'clock tomorrow morning? Have I established an escape route for my children from their bedroom to the outside? Do we have a place outside where we're all going to gather and meet and get a count and make sure everybody's out? Have we done that work around that safety stuff? No. In most cases, we don't want to talk about that because it's not fun to think about. But we have to. And when you go back to your work sites, do that kind of thinking. Do you have those emergency phone numbers programmed into your phones? Do your doors open in or out? Do you have a second escape route? Do you know where all your exits are from where you are? Not just the one you take during the fire drill, but those other ways out. Do your windows open enough to get out? Okay? So think about that kind of stuff when you go back to where you're working. Turn your lights off and try to convince the bad guy there's nobody home. Because this is a crime of opportunity, right? What is this bad guy trying to do? What are they trying to do? Hurt What's that? Hurt people. Kill people, right? and kill as many people as quickly as they can because they know the cops are coming, right? So do you think it's a better use of that person's time when they come up to a door and it's locked and it's all dark inside and there's no sound coming from within that room? Is it a better use of his time to break down that door into a potentially empty room or to move down the hall to the next room where there may be somebody working, right? So like we saw in the video, right, we're hoping that he goes, nobody home, I'm going to the next place, okay? So that's what you're trying to convince him is that there's nobody there okay, in that room. If you can't lock the door, blockade it with heavy furniture. Okay? Get everything in here and put it up against that door. Um, remain calm. I love that one. Remain calm. Pretty hard to do. Pretty hard to do. Easy to say, but hard to do. And call 911 if you can do it without tipping off the bad guy. Okay? So if you think it's going to make too much noise, he's right outside your door, this is not the time to do that. The other thing you should know is now in Maine, you can text 911, um, and it, all the carriers, you can do that now, as of a couple of years ago. Okay? Um, the problem with texting 911, there's a couple little problems with it. One is it only goes into Bangor or Gray, or I think, or Bangor, and one other, south, south, southern Maine uh, answering point. The other part of that is that the geolocator on it isn't as good as it is with a, with a phone call. But it does work, and you can, you can text if you can't speak. If you're in a closet hiding out, you can text. Okay? Remain hidden until you can verify that the cops are there. And what I tell people here is we used to, when I first started doing these classes, we were telling people, get a, you know, there'll be a safe word. So like Blue Moon is the Department of Labor's safe word. right? So when the cops come, someone tell them, Blue Moon's your safe word, so I'm going to go door to door and say, police, Blue Moon, you can come out. right? Well, that's all great, as long as the bad guy's not an employee who knows the safe word, right? So now what I tell people is this. If the, remember what we already established. These things happen and are over with quickly, 
right? So if the last time you heard gunshots was five minutes ago, and you got someone knocking at your door saying, police, you can come out, it ain't the police. Because we got other stuff we got to do. We got to stop the shooter. We got to render aid to all the victims, get them all out into a safe place. And then we're going to bring in special teams of tactically trained people to go in and bring the other victims out of those safe rooms because there might be another shooter or there might be devices or who knows what. So if you got someone knocking at your door slightly after the shooting stop, don't come out. If it's been two hours or three hours and you've got someone saying it's the police, it is. Okay? That's the best way to think about that. So now you're going to hide out. The next thing was to try to keep the bad guy out. And this is a training at Oberlin University. And you can see it's a training because the guy on the right is laughing. He's having a good time. And they're stacking all the furniture up against the door. Do you think that's going to keep a bad guy out if he really wants to get in? No. no. Is it going to slow him down? Is it going to give you maybe time to take another tack? Should he come through that door? Is it better than doing nothing while 30 of us are in this room? Okay, so do it. Take everything here and put it up against those doors. Those little uh, wooden wedges that we use to keep a door open, they'll keep a door shut. OSHA hates me for saying this. Department of Labor probably hates me for it too. But you know, in a case of an active shooter, if you get a door that opens in, Get one of those wedges. I, I like the plastic ones better because they grip better. Stick it under your door. Give it a good kick, right? It's going to slow them down at the very least. A belt wrapped around the handle of a door that opens out, off to the side holding it. You're not coming through that door, okay? So some things to think about. So takeout, and this is the hard one. This is the one that when I first started doing these classes five years ago and I asked that part about what would you do, okay, nobody ever would say fight back. It's changing, and I'm starting to get people who have seen the videos, have gotten the information, they're saying, thinking of it as being a possibility. But why is that? Because we're brought up from the time that we're this big that fighting is not the answer. It's not the way to solve problems, right? Make sense to everybody? But, you know, and I made a career out of telling people, look, if he's there to steal your wallet, give him your damn wallet. It's not worth your life. If you're the pharmacist and they're there to take the drugs, Give them the drugs. It's not worth your life. But what are these people coming to take? Your life, your life right? And the last time I checked, you are allowed under Maine state law to protect your life with the use of force up to and including deadly force if deadly force is being used against you, right? Now, you've got to do it the right way. I'm not trying to create a class of vigilantes who are going to run, a guy, run after a guy outside. Right? But if he's coming through the door right now and your senses are telling you that you don't have time and distance to leave okay, or to hide, then we need to do what we need to do to protect ourselves against the imminent use of deadly force. Imminent means immediate. It's happening. He's coming through the door. Okay? So I encourage you to think about that as a possibility. All right? Remember, the bad guy wants to kill as many people in the room as he can. And he's going to do it unless someone stops him if he comes through the door. Right? So how do you do that? How do you, how do you use that kind of force? To do that, you need to act as aggressively as possible toward the shooter. And, you know, I say that and everybody goes, yeah, yeah. But I mean it. How aggressively would you act if someone was trying to harm your child? That's how aggressively you have to act. Okay? Throw objects at the person's head and yell and improvise weapons. Okay? We, all work in, we all work in a gun-free zone. right? State government is a gun-free area here in Augusta. So you're going to have to improvise some weapons. And what in this room would make a good weapon? Hmm? A flag, a pen, fire extinguisher, chair, car keys, anything. Anything can become a weapon. right? Hmm? Cameras, absolutely. The camera stand, cameras. Whatever you can get, okay, can become a weapon. We all saw the video where the guy takes the fire extinguisher and he's going to... No, I would have sprayed him with it. Then I would have hit him with it, okay? We also realize that not everybody has it in their makeup to do something like that. And it's okay. That's why the video has the bad actress who's cowering in the corner and whimpering, right? But it's trying to make that point that we understand that not everybody's going to be able to do that when the time comes. But what I'm hoping is by going around and training state employees, and then hopefully this will lead into a program of training followed by planning, followed by practice, 
that when the time comes and someone in the room says, listen, if he comes through that door, we're going to fight him, that everybody else is going, oh, yeah, I remember that class. Let's go, okay? And everybody's of like mind, okay? And you don't have to try to convince other people that it's okay. It's really okay. You won't get fired. We're going to do this, right? Because sometimes, like the plane that landed in a field in Pennsylvania on 9-11 showed us, is sometimes we need to roll, okay? There was a train over in Europe with three young guys who were former military on the train. They just made a movie about it, right? Well, they couldn't run. They were on a train. They couldn't hide. They were on a train. So what did they do? They fought back. And who knows how many people they saved that day, right? So commit completely to your actions as individuals or as a group that we're going to stop this guy. Do whatever is necessary to survive. In law enforcement, we call it a survivor mindset and in the military. And that's what you need to do. You need to think, I'm going to make it out of here. We're going to get through this, okay? We're going to stop him if he comes through that door. Remember earlier I told you that not everybody down at Orlando at the nightclub had to die? There were like 14 or 15 men in the bathroom down there when the bad guy came in. And none of them fought him. None of them. And they all perished. And had they just fought back, some of them may have walked out. I don't think they all would have, but they didn't all need to go. So that's a decision that you're going to have to make, and you're going to have to make quickly if he's coming through the door. If I use the analogy, let's say the bad guy is a grizzly bear, right? And he goes into a pen, and this is what he finds inside. So how many of these sheep is that grizzly bear going to get? Every single one of them if he's hungry, right? Because he's a grizzly bear. Let's say he goes into the same pen, and this is what he encounters. Now, don't get me wrong. If this comes here to state government or to wherever you are, it's going to be horrific. And it's going to be the worst thing you've ever lived through, but you can live through it. And not everybody has to perish. So I encourage you to, to uh, take my advice and fight back. So when it happens, you're going to yell gun. You're going to charge and swarm the guy. And what we, what we recommend is, you, listen, you're trying to get control, right, and stop this bad guy. So how's the best way to do that? Everybody remember pig pile, right, on the playground? That's what we want you to do. Charge and swarm the guy as a group. Get him to the ground. Get on top of him. Take the gun away. Okay? Make sure that when the police come, nobody's standing there holding the gun. Because we don't want you to be mistaken for the bad guy. And communicate with 911. Tell them we're in the, you know, we're in the conference room here at the Safety Works conference room at 45 Commerce Drive. The bad guy's on the ground. We got him. Um, nobody will be holding the gun when you come in. What I tell people to do is take the gun, put it on the floor, stand on it. Put your hands up when the police get there. Right? You're controlling it. Nobody else can get it. Okay? These are pictures from that same um, college, Oberlin College. And we'll never get to the point where we're doing these kind of drills in state government because we're all old and workers' comp. And, <laughs> and I don't think you'd ever go for it, right? But you can tell it's a training because here again she's laughing. Uh, the guy in the black is a bad guy. You see them charging and swarming, getting control of the gun, and then there they are pig piling on him with a, with a sheet over the guy's eyes so he can't see and calling 911. So that's what we advocate. We've seen it happen in, uh, on flights, right, where they got some guy on the plane who's acting cagey, and the other passengers get him in the aisle and pile on top of him, and they land the plane, the cops come in and take the guy into custody. That's a good outcome, right? And that's what we're advocating for. Any questions about that? Does that make sense to everybody? So, when the police arrive, what should you expect from us? What are, what's our task going to be? And what should we expect from you? Law enforcement's primary response, the first thing we're going to do is stop that shooter. So as long as we still got a guy killing people, that's our goal, to stop him. One of the things now is um, we all train the same way. We all train rapid response, get in there and try to stop the shooter. We used to train, and some people had places had policies that you had to go in in a team of four. Okay. And in San Bernardino, um, that's what they did. They waited for four officers. And that's an area with a lot of cops. And still, by the time the cops got a team of four, the two bad guys had already left and fled the scene. Right? So now we don't wait. Most places are changing their policies now. How long would it take to get four cops out to Miranda Cook High School in Reedfield on a Tuesday afternoon? Too long. right? So when the cops arrive, they have to make a decision. Do I have time to wait for another cop or do I go in? Okay. And in rural Maine, in most cases, it's going to be I'm going to go in. But we all train the same way. We had a training here last year for our police 
Um, we took one of the vacant buildings over at the MHI complex. We brought three instructors up from Texas and spent two days training with Augusta PD, with the Sheriff's Department, with all the other law enforcement and state government so that when we go, if we've got two guys from Augusta PD, one of our guys and a sheriff's deputy shows up, we can form a team and go because we all train the same way, right? Cops may be carrying any number of weapons. They may be dressed, one, they may be in a suit with a traffic vest over it that says police, okay? We will not stop to help wounded victims or others until we stop that shooter. Once that happens, we'll go in and help them. Actually, we're lucky here in Augusta. Our medics here in Augusta on the rescue squad are all tactically trained. They have bulletproof vests. And we'll go in and start treating the wounded before the shooting is even stopped in some cases, as long as we're sure we got that shooter away from where they're working. What should you do? Okay, you know what we're going to be doing. We're going to the bad guy, right? So what should you be doing? Come out with your hands up, your fingers spread, and listen to what you're being told for orders by the cops, right? It says, police may assist you to the ground for your safety. I love that. That's Department of Homeland Security talk. This is what the translation of that is. Get the hell out of my way. I got something I got to do. Okay? There's a guy killing people in here. All right? So avoid pointing or screaming or yelling. Um, don't try to ask me directions. What I tell people is if we're coming in this way, you go out that way because the bad guy is not behind us. He's in front of us. Um, after you reach that safe location, whatever your plan says to go to, stay there. Okay? So you're outside the building. You're at, you know, if your plan says you're going to go over to 51 Commerce and lock in, and you're in there and you're locked in and you're safe, you can't go home and see your babies. Okay? You're going to want to. I want to get in my car and leave, but why can't you leave? Right. First thing is accountability, and you're a witness to a crime. Okay, you're going to have to be interviewed. So you can't leave. If you do leave, you're going to have to call in and make sure someone knows where you are and that we can get you and that you're outside. Okay, make sense to everyone? Anybody have any questions so far about those response options? When when you do each one, is it, does it make sense to everybody? Okay, good. So I was a Boy Scout. So this is the uh, the Boy Scout motto, right? Which is be prepared. So what I advocate is that this becomes a program, not just a class, okay? And in some state agencies, we're there. We're, we've done the class. Um, we've done something like you're doing here. They filmed it, and they show it to new employees when they come in. Um, and, and that part of it, everybody's trained, is done. But then the next step is to develop that plan, right? And you get that plan of what are we going to do? Well, if it happens here, what are we going to do? And then the third part of the program is to practice that plan by conducting drills, okay? We do it in our schools now, right? They're required to drill for active shooter, you know? And so that's what I'm hoping we get to in public sector employers like the state government, that we get to the point where we do the training, we have our plans, and we drill those plans to make sure they work. So the first part of that is developing that plan. Right? And when I talk about an EAP here, I'm talking about an emergency action plan, not about the employee assistance program. Okay? So that plan, um, and, and Mike has said they're working on it here, it shouldn't be a 14-page plan. Because what have we said? We need to make it simple so people know what to do. Right? We're gonna, we're gonna, and it should empower you to do those things, run, hide, and fight. Right? And it should empower you to know where you're going when you hide. And to know where you, so it's going to supply you with where those safe rooms are in your facility, right? And it should empower you to know where you're going when you run outside, right? Are we going to lock in at the state police garage, or are we going to all scatter, or are we all going to the 51 Commerce, or what is our plan, right? And then to practice that when we get to that point. So these are all the things that the plan should include. And one of the things I advocate is that we walk through the facility and we look for those rooms that would make good safe rooms, right? Pretty easy to do. This would make a good safe room because there's a solid door. Maybe we should put a trauma kit inside that room. Okay. Maybe we should have a hardline telephone inside that room. Um, but this would be a good basic safe room. And maybe we should identify that safe room so that employees know where it is. Department of Fish and Wildlife, we went through their building, and they took their little sticker with the department logo and put it on all the doors of all the rooms that we determined were safe rooms. So when employees running down the hall, they see a door with a department logo, they jump in that room, right? DHHS, one of the facilities we did there, they just took uh, construction paper and they made a colored diamond 
and they put it on all those rooms so the employees know, but someone else might not know that that's a safe room, right? So that's good stuff. That's the kind of planning we're hoping we get to when we, get, when we start doing this. The other part of that is I've been on this soapbox for five years, and we're still not there with a real-time uh, notification system for state government. And hopefully we get there. It took Virginia Tech being sued for other colleges to do it, but now they all have it, right? So hopefully we get there in state government um, sooner than later. I always joke that we, would, we all know we're going home at noontime for a snow day quicker than we would know that we had a shooter in one of our buildings. <laughs> Why do you think that is that the state's not on board? Because I think we're great at closing the barn door after the cow's out. You know, I think until something happens and we have employees that are demanding it, that managers, um, it's money, you know, and, um, you know, legislators and money, then, you know, we, we had a heck of a time trying to get our facilities hardened. It's happened because we have to. Um, but I've been here for 30 years and I've seen that as a process, right? First, first we put, um, first we had to get receptionists who took people down people's names who came to a facility and closed some of our outside doors. Then we had to put the receptionist out of the lobby and maybe behind glass. And now we got the glass going up to the ceiling and it's bulletproof, right? So it's, a, it's an ongoing progress, progression. I think the reason for that is six words, out of sight, out of mind. Exactly, and I think that's human nature for the most part, unfortunately, you know. Um, but I got to tell you, you know, you know how many kids have died in a school in the United States in the last 50 years from a fire? None. No, very few. None. Do you know why? couple reasons. One is you can't burn a school down because code requires us to have sprinklers, it requires us to have uh, alarms, smoke detectors, right? And also they drill. Every month they have a fire drill, every other month, right? You know how many kids have died in a school in the United States from violence in the last 50 years? Over 3,000, okay? So why haven't we hardened our schools? Why haven't we required through code that we build in safe rooms? and that we build in bulletproof glass, and that we don't have open doors, okay? We're getting there because the public is demanding it now after Columbine, after Parkland, and after Sandy Hook, right? And we now are required to do drills in our schools, and we have those mass notification systems. But like he just said, out of sight, out of mind, until we can't, we can't turn our head to it any longer. They say these are hard doors, but it's so easy to get through. A lot of places haven't done it yet, you know, okay? I didn't have my badge one time, and I was like, did, hey, I'm an employee. Yep. Nice. We're going to get to that. Go We're going to get to that. So you got your plan, okay? And it is awesome. We had a committee. We met. The first five or six meetings, the whole half of the meeting, the whole second half of the meeting was deciding who, when we could get together for the next meeting. Because I've been in state government for a long time, and I know how it works. Okay? But you get that plan, and on paper it looks awesome, okay? But you've got to practice it, because how do you know if it's going to work unless you practice it, right? And I give you an example of Riverview Psychiatric Center. We police Riverview, okay? And their safety guy came to me one day and said, we want to we wanna do a drill for uh, workplace violence, and we'd like to have you guys help us with that. I said, absolutely, what do you want to do? So we came up with a scenario where we were going to have one of our young adult cops who was going to come in in plain clothes, and he was going to portray the... Uh, adult son of a woman who worked up in their administration area, okay? Because we didn't want this to go on the, on the units where the clients were because we didn't want to interrupt that, okay? So we're going to do it in the more public area of the hospital up in the administrative wing. So he was going to come in. He was going to go up to see his mother who worked there. They were going to end up getting into a verbal argument. He was going to strike her with a bookend, you know, make believe. She was going to be injured, and then he was going to barricade himself in her office, okay? So we were going to see how their plans for that kind of violence worked, okay? And then we had, so we had police officers staged to respond, we had EMS staged to respond. I was there with a clipboard, the deputy chief from Augusta PD was there, um, fire chief was there, we had some risk managers there to see how this played out and how it worked. So sure enough, the guy came in, he went upstairs, um, they get in a fight and all this. So in Riverview, when there's a problem on one of the client units where the, where the, uh, where the patients are, all the staff members carry pagers. So what they do is someone hits a stat page. So all the staff members, all the mental health workers and everybody, they come off all the other patient units and they go to the unit where the problem is to give help, right, to help get control of that patient. And that's how they respond. So um, 
we're up in the administrative area, someone has a pager. They hit a stat page. So about 25 mental health workers and others come off the units and run up into the office area. Okay? So now, if I had an active shooter, what have I done? I'll bring victims to you. You don't have to go looking. We'll provide them to you. Okay? So then, because the female employee has been struck with a bookend and she's injured, someone hits a medical stat. So now all the nurses, PAs, and doctors come off the units and they come running up into that area. Okay? So when my cops arrive, we've got like 35 or 40 people standing outside this room where this dangerous guy is barricaded. So on paper, their plan looked awesome. But when we practiced it, we saw this little problem, that maybe we should treat events on the client units differently than we do in the more public sector, public areas of the hospital. Right? So what did we do? We had an after action meeting. We all got together, talked about it tweaked the plan, and about two months later we did another drill in their record section that went flawlessly. Okay? So that's what I mean. When you get that plan, you've got to practice it. And we've done that in state government. Uh, we had a drill down here at MEMA one day because I wanted to start doing it there because I figured they had good advice for me. Um, we've done drills at some of the DHHS facilities. We've done drills at that professional financial regulation down in Gardner and um, several other places. Um, I, and I'm being told that, that there's been some buy-in in your department to do it here. So how do you do that? How do you do a drill? Well, the first thing is, you know, use us as a, use us as a, as a resource for that. Um, and it shouldn't be a surprise. Un, unlike the fire drill, we want everybody to know, next Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, there will be an active shooter drill with simulated gunfire. Okay? So we don't want anybody thinking it's real. Okay? So we try to pick a time when there are very few outside meetings and people from the public in there. We tell receptionists that day, if people come in, make sure you tell them that at 10 o'clock there's going to be a drill. Assign them to a staff member who will be with them when the drill occurs. Okay? And what we do is we come in. Um, usually I have um, one of my officers in plain clothes wearing a traffic vest. I assign him to with a uh, manager from that building who everybody knows, so like Mike might be the manager. So if someone comes around the corner and they see them standing there, they don't attack them. They recognize Mike as being a good guy, right? Um, and we go in, we got a couple pieces of two by six about that long with a hinge. We start slapping those together. It sounds every bit as loud as a 22 handgun, yelling and screaming and making our way through a facility slowly. Bad guy is a, we, bad guy portrays an employee, so they have an access badge, okay? So then we expect employees to do what? Run, hide, fight. Right? So if your sensors are telling you you've got time and distance from that sound, you're going to leave. You're going to evacuate. It's done about half speed. Right? We don't want anybody falling down hurting themselves. If you can't do that, you're going to hide out. And if the guy's coming through the door, you would articulate to him, I would fight you right now. Okay? We're not going to have anybody in a red suit. We don't want to take a flagpole. Okay? But you just tell him, I would fight you right now. Okay? Takes about 15 or 20 minutes, goes great. Okay? So we've got one building, a DHHS building down on State Street, 242 State Street, which you go past the Capitol down the little dip, used to be the BMV there on the right. We've done, we just did our fourth year of drills there. Every spring we do a drill. And the first year we did it, we got 12 victims. And there's about 160 people that work in the building, which I didn't think was too bad. I thought it was pretty good, right? Because some people you can't help. As soon as you walk in, they're standing there. Their victim, right? So one room I came to, they were all locked in this room hiding. I could hear them talking in there. I banged on the door, boom, 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 boom. You're all dead. I can hear you in there talking. So do you think the next drill they were doing that? No, because they practiced, right? This last year we got four victims. That's all. And I got to tell you, I got an email from the manager down there who said, uh, I just thought I, I should let you know that during the shoot at the uh, Las Vegas at the uh, concert. One of our employees, her adult daughter, was caught in that gunfire. And she called her mother as she was crouched and hiding. And her mother was able to get her, give her good solid advice of what she should do based on the fact that she had had this training, they had their plans, and they had practiced those plans. How do you think that made me feel? Pretty good use of my time doing this today, right? Okay, so you should be taught to recognize that sound of gunfires and to react quickly when you hear that shot, right? 
So you will practice evacuating, hiding, and fighting back. We usually put 911 on notice that one person will be calling them. So we ask the receptionist to make that call. Um, they all know it's an exercise. They say exercise, 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 and tell them what they've got going on. Um, we practice things like, anybody here a front desk receptionist? Or re no? We tell them to take that book where people sign in with them, right? Because we're going to want to count of who's in and who's out. And you're going to go to those safe locations and assemble there. Okay? So what are your responsibilities as employees, right? The first thing is, we just talked about it a little bit, is you have some responsibilities when it comes to your safety. Okay? Those safety protocols and all those alarms and all those car doors that are locked and all those cameras, you think we spend all that money because we like it? No, we spend that money to help keep you safe. Okay? So what good does it do for us to put all that in when you take your access card and you flag it on a door and then you let five people who you don't know come in behind you? We call it piggybacking. That access card is for you. It's not for you and the three people behind you. How do you know that that employee behind you wasn't fired last Friday for violence and told not to come back to this campus? How would you like to be the one that let that person in? Politely tell them, I'm sorry, I got, you got to use your own card. Not only that, but every time you swipe that, what's it do? It makes a record. What do you think the first thing that I'm going to do once we stop a shooter, the first thing our agency is going to do? We're going to ask to see those records so we get a somewhat of a count of who came into work that day and who didn't, who might still be in the building and who might be outside, right? So, you know, we put all these, I, I look at security as, you know, you got Fort Knox here where everything's locked down, nobody can go anywhere. And then you've got the way we used to have in state government over here where all the doors are wide open, there's no locks, people can wander in from anywhere. We try to find that point in the middle where we don't have so much security that we're making it so inconvenient that everybody's bypassing our systems but we have enough security that people feel safe at work, right? So do your part and help us try to keep your work site secure. If you don't feel comfortable telling somebody that, okay, then call us. We're great. We're good at getting people mad. It doesn't bother us a bit. We'll come up and tell them. <coughs> Wear your ID badges. And I see several of you have them on today, okay? But if you see someone in your area who you don't know to be there, that they belong there, challenge them. Okay? And I don't mean walk up to them and say, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> I mean, you know, can I help you, sir? You look like you might be lost. Can I, can I help you find where you, where you want? And, and then listen to what they respond. Does it make sense? We have people, trust me on this, who try to get into state government who don't belong here. Okay? It has happened and will continue to happen. So who's responsible? who knows better who belongs and who doesn't belong than those of you that are here every day? Right? Because you're here more than I am. If we have a bomb threat and I go into a facility to look for a device, who do you think I take with me? One of you. Because who knows what's normal and what's not? I don't. That box is underneath that desk. I don't know if that's been there for three months or if it's something new. So I take someone who would know with me to say, oh, no, that's normal. Okay? Good? Report threats. Now, does Department of Labor have a form formalized way to report threats when an employee gets threatened? Some departments who get threatened a lot have very formalized processes. DHS has a very formalized process. Actually, our agency gets notified of every threat made against a DHHS worker anywhere in Maine. Because what we find is if someone's threatening a worker up in Calus, then the next stop is their representative or their, their senator or their, the governor or the commissioner's office, right? But not only that, but the more important question is, does everybody here feel comfortable reporting to a supervisor or a manager when they've been threatened? either from outside or from within, from a coworker. Is there anybody that doesn't feel comfortable doing that? Awesome. That's the most important thing, is that you all feel comfortable should you need to do that. Have those emergency phone numbers pre-programmed into your phones, right? And adhere to those protocols that have been put in place to keep you safe, okay? Any human resources people here? They never come to my classes. <laughs> There are some responsibilities there, and the first is to try, to try to establish a respectful workplace, which I think we do a pretty good job of in state government. Um, hire good people, do background checks, and we now are doing that for the most part when people apply for state jobs. And make counseling available, so that emergency assistance program, I don't know what they're calling it now, 
but that program available to people that might be in need within the workforce, right? So those are some things they could be doing. So what are the signs? What are you looking for, you know, to think that these people might get to a point where they're going to do something like this, okay? And the, the big thing here is, you know, these people don't just snap. I've heard it said, you know, oh, I just snapped. No. Most of the time when one of these events happen, they do an investigation, a back, background investigation, and they found that, that the bad guy told people or that there were indicators that if people were intuitive would have picked up on or they put something on social media, right, or some kind of indication that they may be thinking this way. So I'm not talking about you reporting it when your coworker's just having a bad day. We all had that, right? But what I'm saying is, if you, how many times, other than those of us that are cops, how often in your lifetime have you had somebody who you genuinely felt was going to become violent? He's going to be violent. It doesn't happen that often in most of our lives, right? So when it happens, don't you think that light bulb ought to go off? Don't you think you ought to be intuitive enough to know that that employee is not the way he used to be? And maybe I should tell the manager that I'm concerned that he's going to become violent. Okay? So that's what I'm asking you to do, is to become intuitive to that kind of stuff and report it when you see it. Okay? So what causes people to get to the point where they do something like this? And the first two usually go hand in hand, anger and revenge. So someone's very angry, and like we just showed in the statistics, right, 29% of the people in 2017 that did these kinds of things had a grievance, right? So they were very angry and they want someone to pay for what happened to them. This guy on the screen is Clay Duke. Clay Duke went into a, a school board meeting in Florida and he watched about 20 minutes of the meeting and then he stands up and he spray paints this big V for Vendetta on the wall, okay? And he pulls out a handgun and he holds it on the members of the school board who are sitting at a big desk in the front, like seven or eight of them, okay? And this is being broadcast to the community live, the school board meeting on the internet. So he tells them, he says, uh, he tells them who he is, and he says, I'm Clay Duke, and I'm going to die here today, and so are all of you. And then he goes on to explain that his wife had been um, laid off or fired, I can't remember what, but dismissed from one of the schools in that school system two years before. So now it's been two years, his wife hasn't been able to find work, and Clay Duke is about to lose his house, okay, about to be foreclosed on. So what is he? He's very angry about that, and he wants someone to pay for what they did to him and his wife. So who does he blame? The school board, even though they have no idea who his wife is, right? Probably had no hand in her being let go, but somebody representing that school has to pay, okay? Actually, I'm a cop, and we got pretty warped senses of humor, law enforcement, but there's one scene where he, one of the guys on the school board actually says, well, I don't sign those termination papers. He does. <laughs> but anyway, this ends up where Clay Duke, um, a security guard, comes in and shoots him in the leg. He falls to the ground and commits suicide. So, I mean, nobody else is hurt, which is a pretty good outcome in an event like this, right? But that's that example of anger and revenge going hand in hand. Next one, ideology. And we've talked about this quite a bit, you know, where a guy's a racist and he uses, um, he uses active shooter to go and, and kill someone who, who he opposes. Okay. Untreated mental illness, and we've had close calls of that here in Maine um, and several events of that nationwide, but I don't want to paint with a broad brush. I don't want to stand in front of, here, in front of you and have anybody leave here thinking that people with mental illness are all, are all going to be an active shooter. It certainly is not the case. The vast majority of the people who, um, who fall, uh, become ill with mental illness can function very well in our society, and I don't want anybody thinking that I'm trying to say that that they're all violent or dangerous because the vast majority of them are not. Unfortunately, however, that is a reality. That some people, um, a result of that illness is violence or violent tendencies. So what are those indicators? What should you be looking for that might indicate, and this, hopefully this doesn't look like the guy in the cubicle next to you. Okay. What should you be looking for as signs that someone might become so violent that they might do something like this? I'm going to show you a video, okay? As you watch it, it's not very long. We're going to have you out of here in plenty of time. But think about what indicators you're seeing that the guy in the movie, Mark, might become violent. She can't take half of my money. 
I'm the one who worked for it. Lawyer, do something about it. She's getting the house too? What are you, blind? Hey, this is my parking space. Come on, Mark, I got here before you did. Mark, there are plenty of other parking spaces back there. Mind your own business. This is between me and her. Look, you saw me use a turn signal. It's ridiculous to get upset over a parking space. Jeez. Are you okay? Yeah. Hey. Hey. Hey, Leah. Good morning. Good morning. Well, uh, good luck at that presentation Thanks. today. Have a good day. So, what is eating Mark? He used to be one of the nicer guys around here. Well, I know. Uh, he's been really difficult to work with lately. The other day in a meeting, I heard he left in a huff and. Last week at lunch, okay, I saw it. He totally flipped out because the waitress got his order wrong. Well, I heard he was going through a really messy divorce. Oh, that's no reason to threaten your coworker, you know? Mm -hmm. We should go to HR. I really don't want to do that. I don't want to spend my whole morning at HR. Hi. Hello. Hey. Uh, I heard about what happened in the parking garage. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's just not a great way to start your morning. No kidding. How did you hear? Uh, office gossip, but don't worry, I will take care of it, okay? Thank you, no problem. Gotcha. All right, see ya. See ya. Bye. Have a good day. You too. Thanks. You wanted to see me? Yeah, please, have a seat. I'll stand. Would you mind closing the door, please? Mark, I heard about the incident today in the parking garage. I have to tell you, there have been some consistent complaints about your aggressive behavior, and that type of behavior is not acceptable here. Do you understand? I also need to speak with you about your performance lately. Your work quality's been very poor, and we've decided that we need to place you on a probationary period of one month. We'll be evaluating you weekly, and at the end of that period, if we don't see some significant improvement, then there will be some serious consequences. Mark, you could lose your job over this. Fine. Do you want to discuss this further? I'm happy to answer any questions you have. No. Are we done here? Yes. We're done. This is it. I can't take this anymore. You can imagine where he's going, right? So, what were some indicators we saw in the video? Anger, right? Banging the hood of the car, very angry guy, right? What else? Not, not acting differently than he usually does. Right, over time, there's been a change over time, right? Used to be one of the nicer guys around here, right? Multiple instances, right? Got mad because the waitress got his order wrong, left the meeting in a huff. Things were uncharacteristic for Mark, right? Now, how do you think about, you know, did they tell the manager that? No. I don't want to spend all day in HR. Don't you think maybe that's something that maybe a supervisor should have been told? Is that, look, it was, today wasn't just the only time. I saw it two or three other times. This guy was angry, very angry, right? Makes sense? How about the manager? How do you think she did? 
not so good, right? So, right, you can almost see his attitude, right? You can see he's very defiant. He comes in, he's mad, Doesn't right? And she says, uh, you yeah, and she's, Are you want to sit down? No, I'll stand, you know? So he's assuming it's about the incident in the parking garage. And then she says, and we need to talk about your work performance. And you can see him go from this to, right? So now what's happening, right? Not only am I going to lose my house and lose my wife, right? and I'm going through a really nasty divorce, but I'm going to lose my job too, right? How differently might have that have come out if she'd have said, hey, Mark, what's going on? Maybe you need to go seek some help with employee assistance. Maybe we ought to get you some, someone to talk to. You know, we, you're a valuable member of our team. We want to keep you. What do we need to do to make that happen, right? So what's, that, what's the whole basic of, the, of that? Being intuitive and recognizing, right, when someone's going to become violent. So let's look at some of these, uh, some of these uh, possibilities. And this is an all-inclusive list, but these are some things to look for. Increases in use of alcohol and drugs. We don't know if that's the case with Mark in the video, but it's an indicator. Unexpected increases in absenteeism. So someone who's been a really good, steady employee who all of a sudden is calling in sick all the time, doesn't seem to care. Same thing with the way they look. We saw it with Mark in the video, right? Shirt was all untucked, tie was askew. You think he looked that way his first day on the job? Probably not. So that, you know, someone who doesn't care so much about hygiene or, or the way they look. Depression and withdrawal. Repeated violations of workplace policies. So the first, not, we always got those people, right? Everybody's got those people. But I'm talking about someone who that's, that's kind of a new characteristic. Never, hadn't really been that way. But now all of a sudden they don't seem to care about the rules. Um, explosive outbursts of anger or rage. Increase in talks of problems at home. Because believe it or not, what happens at home comes to work with us. Right? I can guarantee you that because I see it all the time. And what happens at work comes home with us. Right? Escalations in domestic problems in the workplace. Talk of for, for, for severe financial problems. So taking all those things into account. Talks of previous incidents of violence with empathy toward the individual committing that violence. So what is that? That's someone who is trying to justify in their own mind what they're thinking may, they may want to do. You know those kids in Columbine. They didn't have any choice, you know. They were being bullied. They did what any one of us would have done. So what is that? That's someone who's trying to justify the unjustifiable in their own mind. Okay. Same thing with a person who seems obsessed with guns who's not the guy that's on the shooting team, right? It's a, all he wants to talk about is his new Glock. That's uncharacteristic and a change, okay? And those increases in severe mood swings. So all things that you can look to to be a more intuitive coworker that these things might, might be happening, right? So Teddy Roosevelt once said, if, if a bad thing happens, the best thing you can do is the right thing, okay? The next best thing you can do is the wrong thing. And the worst thing you can do is nothing. So when this comes to you, right, wrong, or indifferent, do something. Okay? And that's what I hope you leave here today. I hope you leave here on that side of this screen. Because where you start is going to be the same place, startle and fear. Okay? But where you go from there, once we've trained, have our plans, and we practice those plans, just like with the fire, you're all got a plan. You know what you're going to do if there's a fire, right? You feel anxious, then you recall what you learned and what you rehearsed, okay? Then you prepare to, to act as you rehearsed, and you commit completely to your actions. If he comes through that door, we're going to take him, right? People that haven't done this work, are on, done that daydreaming, okay, are on the other side of the screen. We've all seen it on the news at night where the, where the, the reporter goes up to the woman and she says, I thought that was firecrackers. Nothing like that ever happens in this neighborhood. We live in a safe neighborhood. What is that? That's lost in denial, right? Can't happen here. Got my head in the sand, okay? So my hope is that everybody ends up on the train side. So that's what I have for you today. What questions do you have for me? Uh, in my workplace, we were talking about this and had some discussion about, you know, do you pull, if it's an active shooter situation, do you pull the fire alarm because then all everybody pours into the hallways and then you also talk about everybody's gathering at a location you know what's your thought that's, on that that's always the question i get and before i do that before i forget it because my mind come kind of a little bit joggy is we didn't talk about the bad guys outside your facility right he hasn't gotten in yet so what's the plan then keep them out right lock your doors close your doors 
Keep them outside, right? During, and that's one thing we don't teach our kids. We do lockdown drills with our kids in schools, but we don't teach them, if the guy's outside, keep him outside, right? In, in uh, Parkland, the guy was already in the school, and you had teachers getting their kids in, into the school where they'd be safe, and he was already in there. So stay outside if he's inside. Stay inside if he's outside, right? But let me get back to that. We don't encourage people to pull a firearm. The reason for that is that people will do what they do during a fire drill, and they may be walking right out into danger. They may be going out to an area of the parking lot where the bad guy knows they're going to go to. Um, so we don't encourage that you pull the fire alarm during a drill like this, during an event like this. However, without some other way to notify people, it may be the best you've got. So, you know, there is no right answer, there is no wrong answer, but I just, you need to think about that. You know, and uh, in most cases, I would much rather see another way to let people know. I'll give you an example. Down at the Fish and Wildlife Building, it's a little small building, which makes it easy for them. They've got two different alarms. They get a blue one, which is their active shooter, that goes off and has a different sound than their red one, which is for fire. So when the blue one goes off, they take active shooter protocols. When the red one goes off, they do their fire, fire stuff, right? But, I mean, in lieu of that, the best you might have is the fire drill. So I, I, I'm sorry I can't give you a more definitive answer. So what happens if you can't lock the front door because it automatically locks and unlocks? So how do you keep a shooter out in that case when the doors, you know, the glass doors coming into the building? Yep, you need to find out how to get those locked. Yeah, and in most of our buildings, you can make a phone call to building control and they can lock them up. I think that's the case here, but I'm not 100% sure. So one of the things the safety team needs to do when they make those plans is find out how that's done. And if it's not possible, maybe you come up with another way to, to close them. Maybe you put some kind of a bar across the door or something like that. But that's that kind of thought process that I'm hoping, you know, one of the best things about this class is during the break, people start talking, right? Oh, what if, what if, what, what would we do? And continue that. When you go back to your work sites, continue that work of thinking how to harden your places. Okay. Anything else? Nothing else. If you have an idea or a, or a question, I'm in the global, Robert S. Elliott at Maine.gov. Feel free to drop me an email. I will respond. It might be a day or two, but I will get back to you. Um, the other thing is, if you want more information, um, I suggest you go to the Department of Homeland Security, type in active shooter, and a plethora of information will come to you. Everything from, from cards on what to do to little booklets to uh, examples of action plans. No reason to recreate the wheel, right? Um, if you want examples of other state agencies' action plans, you know, the, the planning committee, I have those available. So, you know, if, use us as a resource. That's why we're here. I do appreciate you taking time out of your afternoon to be with me. Um, I appreciate your managers for making this a priority that you get this training. And uh, if you need Capitol Police for anything, give us a call. Thank you.